Facilities Feasibility Committee meeting for September 14th. It's 5.02. Um, so we'll be calling the meeting to order. Um, we don't specifically have it in the initial item, but there is a little bit of a change to make to the agenda. Uh, there's a uh, an item eight. It refers to a document that's the option matrix. That document actually is needed for the discussion in item seven. So um, um, it, if we can just move that to item seven, that would be great. Um, do we have a volunteer for taking minutes? Sarah has her hand up, does that mean? I can do it, Kevin, that's fine. Great, thank you. Um, so that'll take care of our bookkeeping stuff. The next thing is public comment. So we should check with anybody and see if there's public comment. Yeah, and I, so folks that are calling in or, or uh, visitors, if you can raise your virtual hand, then that'll let us know that you have a public comment to make or you can put something up in the chat. We did get an email from Herb Olson indicating that he was interested in the public comment section. So with your permission, Kevin, I can give Herb uh, permission to speak. Okay. All right, Herb, if you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak now. Let's try that. All right. Uh, does anyone hear me now? Yeah, you sound good. Okay. I, I'm uh, digitally a little deficient here. Uh, so you don't see me. I think I'm on the phone, um, uh, but I'd like to make a couple of comments. You're live. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Herb Olson. Uh, my wife and I live at the end of Island Road in Starksboro. We have a couple of sons, graduated from Robinson and uh, Mount Abe uh, Low these many years ago. Over the weekend, I have read uh, the minutes and other documents of your subcommittee, and, and it's pretty clear that people are working very hard, and I, I really appreciate that. It's, it's, uh, it, it's good to have people doing this. I also read the comments by Jeff Meller, uh, and it's note dated August the 23rd. And the main thing I wanted to say uh, this afternoon is that I wholeheartedly agree with his comments. I'm not gonna take the time to repeat everything that he has already said, but I wanted to expand on a couple of those comments a, a, a bit. My first comment is that from the outside, it looks like the decision to close community schools may have already been made by some without consciously acknowledging uh, what I th see as the real and important values of community schools for students and for the entire education program. Uh, for students, especially pre-K and elementary grades, and especially for uh, kids who are at risk either because of special needs or poverty, um, uh, if the sco community schools often do a better job um, and if these programs are, if these schools are closed, I think the district is going to need to consider expanding some pre-K programs to mitigate against the potential harm. Uh, of course, that's going to cost money too. Uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's all a matter of balancing financial issues. Um, I also, for the entire education program, my sense is that community schools foster community ownership which often translate to community support, uh, support for the entire educational program in the district. This is an important consideration, especially uh, when budgets are voted and in these uh, challenging economic and financial times we're in. I think there's a perception that those who support retaining schools do, to do so for a naive or antiquated uh, feelings, divorce from financial realities, and I think that perception is mistaken. Uh, my second general comment is to expand on Mr. Miller's observation about the lack of cost information. Specifically, I think we need better and more detailed financial information on potential savings and costs of each alternative before considering whether to close one or more schools. Better information 
would identify specific personnel, operational, and other savings and costs associated with each and every option. Short-term and long-term savings and costs would be identified. Better financial information would also identify and quantify all existing program, operational, and administrative functions so that decision makers can weigh the value of retaining community schools with the value of re re retaining these existing functions with or without uh, modifications. I thank you for the opportunity to uh, share these thoughts and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your comments. We don't typically interact with the comments, but we uh, will take them under advisement. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry to hear that, but um, um, I know that's the way things are set up here. Have fun. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? I mean, not to interrupt, but is there a way to get the Google Doc version of the agenda? Because it's only sent to us as a PDF. So. Um, but I think mine has links in it, if that's what you're looking for. Well, I can't make a copy of it to do the minutes within. Oh, so, I, see. I see what you're saying. I think everyone had permission. I think it was, I think it was, but I just shared it with you. It should pop right to the top of your email. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So is there any other public comment? I don't see any hands up. I don't see anything in the chat. We have two phone calls, two, two phone callers now. Neither of the numbers look familiar to me. Um, so again, I'm not sure if one of those is Jeff, but usually he, he's been attending in other ways, so. Uh, so we, you can promote them to ask, to, to, to identify themselves and then move them back or not. All right, let me try. All right, phone caller with number ending in 8226. You're able to speak now if you unmute yourself or just checking to see if you're Jeff, who is one of the missing members of this subcommittee. Okay, hearing none. Phone caller ending in 8580. You can now speak if you unmute yourself or just checking to see if you're Jeff. Sounds like neither of the phone callers are Jeff, so I'll disable their time. So then the next tech, the next uh, thing on the agenda would be the minutes. Anybody like to make a motion to um, accept the mission minutes? Seems like you'd want to do that, Josh. Uh, I was wondering if I was able to accept my own minutes. <laughs> sure, a uh, motion to accept the minutes. <clears throat> I second it. Any discussion? I was distracted. I've got a few few comments to the the minutes were very detailed, seven pages of them. So thank you for that. But I I do have a few comments. I think that we need to clarify the record that um, on page six there was a mention of a motion to table items um, six and seven, I believe, and only or five and six, and only five was was part of the motion to table was my recollection. And then um, on page six as well, the committee comments, closing comments, and the community closing comments um, 
we're not separated into items six and seven. So I don't know how we go. So I would like to make a motion to modify those change or have a motion to modify those changes, I guess. I shouldn't be probably making a motion, but then I guess we need to understand how the mechanics are doing that. I think if, if someone is willing to make that motion, uh, probably best if you don't as the chair. Um, so probably looking to Sarah to make that motion as the only one that didn't write the notes from last time and isn't the chair. Actually, Jeff has joined us, so Jeff could do that now. Um, and then we could uh, we could vote to, to amend the motion that was made to accept the minutes with your changes, Kevin, and then vote on that um on that as afterwards yep so you want me to make a motion to adapt the minutes based on kevin's changes okay i make a motion to adapt the minutes and reflect kevin's changes second so is there any discussion So um, hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Okay. So now we're back you to you. approving the minutes. Yep. Any discussion, any further discussion on approving the minutes? No. So ha hearing none, everybody that's, um, in favor of approving the minutes, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Can I just clarify who, how do I do that in the minutes? <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the minutes were moved by Josh and, and I think I heard a second. I don't know if that was, must have been you, Sarah. That's yeah, I think so. And then there was a motion. Motion to amend by Sarah, seconded by Josh. That was then approved. And then you you came back to the original um, motion to approve the minutes as amended, which was made by, I don't remember who. who Sarah made that motion. Sarah made the motion and then seconded by Josh. Yeah. And then approved. Sounds good. Okay. So motion passed. Okay. So for the record, do you need me to update those that uh, word file and resend to you, Patrick? Yeah, that would be helpful because then we can now that they're approved with those changes, we can post them as approved with that change. Do they get a special note saying that they were modified in this meeting? As uh, no, they'll they'll go on as approved. So everything else is is um, if it's posted, it's posted. Um, as unapproved, and then it will be changed to approved. Okay. So Jeff is calling in on the 8226 number, Patrick. So should we okay. promote that? And Krista was calling in on the other number, and you weren't able to hear either of us. I tried to unmute on the phone to tell you I was here, and apparently she did the same thing. Okay. I, I gave. We're not able to hear either of us. Okay. I'm okay, going to go so back to the phone because uh, I'm going to be in the car shortly. Okay. So I've, I have you with permission to talk now um, through the phone, through the 8226. And Krista, I'm happy to promote Kevin as you see fit. She's not a member of the committee, so I didn't automatically promote her to panelist, but I don't know if she has something in particular. If we missed her during public comment, shall we check in? Um, you know, she's she's chatting and saying she's just listening because she can't figure out how to unmute her phone. Okay. So should be all set, I believe. Okay. So we've gone through the minutes. The next item is a discussion. If there's any update on the NASDAQ report. And then Jeff had already had also emailed Patrick with a um, email with 
some comments on the report as well. So I'm not clear. Um, I thought there was some additional modifications to the options with um, Addison Northwest that was going to drive a change um, in the NESDEC report, but I haven't can't put my fingers on that. So I don't know if that was just incorporated somewhere along the line and it's just automatically in the final report or if there's something there that we need to, or maybe I need to better understand. Yeah, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember the specific, the options one. I think it was, yeah, and I think this version, the newest version that has come out does show, which I think is what has been distributed, um, speaks to a 6.8 and a 9.12. They had some different grade configurations that weren't going to work or sort of make sense for us. And in collaboration with Addison Northwest, they agreed that the 6, 8, 9, 12 split was better than some other grade configuration splits that they had in there. So I think that was perhaps the edit that you're thinking of, Kevin. Okay. Has there been any other information or updates from them since our last meeting? Uh, no, they reached out to me just to check in and see if there was any, any uh, lingering questions that they might be able to help with, which I hadn't heard of any and I didn't have any myself. Uh, and the one piece that is an update we know is forthcoming is once we have our October 1 enrollment information from this year, they're going to include that and, and send a revised demographic study showing the enrollment um, with that most updated information. Other than that, I'm not anticipating any further changes. To that okay. Um, so in a, between last meeting and this, Jeff had emailed um, Patrick with some points. So I guess, um, Jeff, I don't know if you want to kind of talk about them a little bit or if we should just go through it or. And I'm happy to walk through the comments if that's helpful. Patrick, why don't you walk us through them? Okay, sure. Thank you. I have, I have the document up. I think everyone has access to it. Um, so, the, so two things, one costs, and there was no information on costs. Which I agree is important information to have, but I think NESDEC was clear from the beginning that they wouldn't be the ones to calculate costs, that that was a responsibility for the finance team here in MAUSD. And we are working on those. So we don't, it's not complete yet. Um, but I don't think it's anything that NESDEC didn't provide that they said they were going to. We've known all along that that's on us. Um, and then he goes on to say, similarly, in the MAUSD options challenges without cost information, how can you assess the potential costs associated with additions for elementary and middle high schools if needed? I can talk to that a little bit, specifically that first quotation, because in conversations with NESDEC, and I don't remember if that came up in our conversation with NESDEC together, or if it was in my conversations with NESDEC, because depending on which schools we choose, each scenario has the potential for costs associated with an addition, right? So if we chose to operate three elementary schools, if we chose our three smallest elementary schools to operate, we would need to put an addition on one or more of those buildings to house all of our elementary students. If we choose our biggest elementary schools, we wouldn't have to put an addition on to accommodate our students. So um, that's why every scenario has potential costs associated with additions on it, because it depends on which way we go. Um, so that I think explains why that was there. It also talks about a need to restructure and or expand some transportation routes. That is a wondering. Uh, we've been, we're, we're engaging in conversation with Betcha Transit, who's our transportation provider, about that potential cost. Right now, the early indication is that there wouldn't be um, at least not a significant increase in cost to our transportation. And in addition, um, 
there's some confidence that we'd be able to keep bus routes to what the bus routes currently are um, with various reconfigurations. So, so transportation costs and expanded travel time um, at this current moment with our current understanding are not presenting as a, a barrier that we would anticipate. Also costs associated to reconfigure space for new grade levels if needed. Uh, again, not because, because we don't have a square footage problem, depending on, on what schools we would end up operating, uh, I don't see this as a, as a great anticipated cost um, to change different grade levels, right? So if one classroom was a three, four classroom and it's now a five, six classroom, that's not gonna necessitate any significant shift um, or structural change to, to make that space work. Um, the second, second bullet, uh, effective closing schools on small rural towns. Again, that, that's something that, that we were, I was early on in conversation with NESDEC about, and, and again, they said that's not really part of what they do. They said their sense is that it depends on the town. I've since done some, some outreach to folks that, one person actually started their dissertation on the effects of, um, I don't remember if it's necessary to closing small schools or the impact small schools have on uh, small rural towns. And, and in fact, as a superintendent in Vermont, in uh, a district where there are many small uh, schools and has in fact had to close a small school um, that he attended as a student, that he taught at as a teacher, that he was principal of and now is superintendent of. And it's where his kids went to school, so really closely connected. So um, I've had great conversations uh, with that superintendent and, and my understanding in working with him is similar to what Nesdek has said, um, just sort of in, in casual conversation, that it depends on the town and what other resources the town has and what other um, sort of aspects of the fabric of the town are currently present um, that could make up for what might be lost in, in having a small, a small rural school. So again, that's, it's very dependent on the town. I think it's an important factor that has to be weighed along with the financial factors and the curricular focus. Um, and, it's, and it's something that we have to assess town by town as we look at that town uh, in its entirety and what it provides um, for its, uh, its community members. Um, then he goes on to talk about the, um, the students, the 54 students that were identified in the report that are here in our towns, but are in different schools um, and no doubt have different stories. And, and that if we could provide what those families feel their children need and are seeking elsewhere, something that in the private sector would be considered competitors, then that could become 54 new students that we get to count and get sort of spending credit towards. Um, I don't disagree, those, uh, those students are real and they do exist and there is a range of reasons why they're not in our public schools. And some of them are in local private schools. Some of them are in a home study program. Uh, I'm not sure if that number, I'd have to look again to see if that included the students that choice out, say from Mount Abe to other high schools. And for those students, we do get, um, we do get to sort of count them as our students. Um, and I think it's, it's tricky because there are so many different reasons Right, so even if we just think about the home study program, there are many, many reasons why a family may choose to home study uh, their, their children. And I'm not sure there's anything we could do for some of those reasons, right? Um, we can't replicate a home study environment uh, with any kind of efficiency. And even if it was efficient, it's not their home. So. I think it's, um, it, I'm not sure how realistic it would be to think that we could bring in all 54 students. Not that we couldn't do something to try and understand more about why those students aren't enrolled in our public schools. Um, 
And if there was a pattern, then maybe it would present some options to entice those students back into our schools. Um, but I think that that gets pretty complicated pretty quickly to try and figure out what and how. Number three, uh, as we discussed in the number of dwellings is increasing. Presumably that implies the tax base is rising and with the number of pupils is falling. Presumably that implies there's more dollars available per pupil for education um, without taking account of equalization. I think that's, to an extent that's true, right? A bigger tax base is a good thing that helps sort of spread the cost of lots of things, including education across more homes and more people. Um, but I don't think that necessarily, while that may have an impact on the tax rate, it's not gonna change what our spending threshold is gonna be, um, our cost per pupil, et cetera, which are really the things that are uh, the significant drivers in, in education funding. Um, I think even even with a rising tax base the the sort of working understanding has been if we put a budget out for a vote that requires people paying tax penalties that vote is likely unsuccessful and I'm, I'm not sure a bigger tax base necessarily changes that Uh, number four, he says that in the MAUSD options advantages, the report concludes that potential utilization of vacated elementary facilities by collaborative programs, municipal and civic organizations. Rather than an advantage, he thinks that this might be a disadvantage. In smaller towns like Lincoln and Starksboro, there may not be programs and organizations to take as much or any space offered by those schools. This could have a negative cost impact if the vacant space still must be paid for and operated. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say to that, but the the idea of empty buildings that don't get used doesn't sound like a great use of whatever those dollars are to maintain those buildings. And if there's debt, um, as is most notably the case with Lincoln, that adds another dimension. Um, yeah, I think those are, are certainly factors that need to be considered in the in the grand scheme. Uh, operational savings due to the closure of elementary schools. Again, there's no data agreed. Uh, that's data that we're working on sort of in the back of the house um, calculating as we look at what it would mean for uh, staffing reductions, the operational savings from a facilities perspective, and what that all sort of adds up to in real dollars, at least projections. Uh, so that's that's work that's ongoing and, and that will have to become part of the conversation at some point. What's tricky is um, we have so many options out there right now and the amount of time it takes to do that work for each of the options, it's, it's somewhat unfeasible to take that all on. Uh, so we have to really work to pare the options down a little bit from where they are. Because we had our, what I think four options and NESDEC gave us a few more that we could consider. Um, so I think we need to talk, talk through some of those based on their sort of principles and merits um, and kind of whittle those down to a few that we can really dig a lot deeper in and get some more concrete numbers on. Number five, the option which does not seem to be under consideration, which seems most nearly to reflect community concerns would be retaining all five elementary schools. I believe that towns must vote to close their elementary school. That's true. And I assume for the sake of argument that none will, it's possible. Um, that this means that consolidating the middle and high schools at either in one or two locations would be the focus of savings. So might it be helpful to see a, at a macro level, the net outcome of closing one middle school and one high school. Yeah, there was, so one of the options that we had put forth to NESDEC, so before the NESDEC study, this came out of the work of the fall and the winter, was to not operate a high school. And I think the option was not operate a high school, have a single K-8 building, which would likely be at Mount Abe, and do that costing. Um, 
which I think is a little different than what Jeff has here as a thought. So again, it's a, it, it's a matter of trying to think through, you know, thinking about community values, thinking about um, all those sorts of things to narrow this down a little bit to give us something that we can reasonably dig a lot deeper into. And similarly, the committee principles and questions also raise the option of not operating in middle and high school at all and tuitioning our kids. So that, that's more like one of the options that, that came out from the fall and winter, pre-NESDEC. So those are my thoughts on, on, on the thoughts that Jeff shared. Uh, obviously, there's potential for a lot more conversation on any one of those topics. Not sure where you want to go from there, Kevin. So um, we we are not on schedule as far as the agenda is concerned, but um, I don't know if anybody has any burning comments on um, on it, or we just take it under advisement and move on. I think um, there's a lot of merit to Jeff's email and um, some of the comments dance. Uh, in and out of where we are and where we're going, which is good. Um, there's some comments that kind of get outside of the charge, I feel. And um, But I, I feel like we could probably take this under advisement and move forward. Okay. Was, my sense is that was Jeff's intent when he his email said no need to respond, that he just wanted to share his thinking. So hopefully... Agreed. Okay with that, and I think he's on the phone. Hopefully, so if you if you think otherwise, Jeff, certainly feel free to weigh in. Okay, um, that's that. Um, anybody doesn't uh, have anything else to say? Let's move on to the next item, which sort of starts talking about some of the background information driving that needs to drive that will be driving a decision i guess you could say um at the last full board meeting at the end of august there was extended discussion about um the three pressures whether you want to call them a triad or three three legs to a stool um or there's or any, any other scenarios but um and i had kind of charted out some thoughts or recollections of that conversation and put them in um, one of the one of the attachments the three the three things obviously are dollars programming and brick and mortar and you know given those things there's there's um, there's an assumption that there's a finite amount of whatever you want to quantify for each one of those things that there's too much pressure on one is is going to cause a, a reaction um, from the other and most most of it's controlled by taxpayers ultimately the the whole um, you know funding is actually a, a, a taxpayer approval through um, the annual budget and closing the school is also a taxpayer approval approval by that given town so and programming has a certain amount of pressure but it, it from state and federal requirements so although there is probably some flexibility there um, as opposed to a yes or no vote from the electric so um we should probably bat that around a little bit um and then uh, move on to um some thoughts about the schedule um, of what needs to be done. There is some discussion, was some discussion at the last full board meeting of having a question on the marriage ballot for town meeting, which would drive a certain amount of milestones. And then also, you know, the budget implement, implementations that are currently um, being worked on as well as what will follow in the next year or so. so I don't know if anybody, Patrick, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more to the three pressures or if anybody wants to start kind of 
asking questions or understand, trying to understand that a little bit better. Yeah, I can I can kind of pick up where you started, Kevin, and and, and I agree those are the three pressures. Uh, obviously, there are sort of spin-offs of each of those, but those really are what it boils down to. Um, and basically, the way I've come to to sort of see it is, unless there's some you know pot of gold somewhere that I'm not aware of, the choice is either we have the kinds of programming we want in our schools as they exist now, and the dollars then go much higher, so we don't control then for the dollars, or we keep the dollars where they are and keep the programming what we want, but then we lose some of the brick and mortar that we have, or we have the dollars that we want and we keep the brick and mortar that we want, and then our programming is what we start to lose pretty significantly. So basically it's, we can pick any two of the three, but I don't think we can have all three. And what's interesting is, as Kevin pointed out, taxpayers get to say yes or no to the dollars. Taxpayers get to say yes or no to the brick and mortar. And if the answer to each of those is no, then the default is that programming gets cut. So there isn't a vote that goes on a ballot that says, do you want to cut program? I suspect if we did put that out there, that would not be a favorable vote. Um, but in, in, in reality, if the answer is no, we don't want to spend more money, no, we don't want to have less brick and mortar, then that is a vote for yes, we want to cut programming. And I think that's important for the community to understand how those three interact and what their vote means on the dollars and on the brick and mortar. And that's been part of the conversation um, at the community engagement committee level to try and think about how do we help, how do we help bring this information forward? How do we help continue to get feedback from the community and use that information to really inform the board on what their action needs to be? Because the board gets to decide what to ask the voters to act on. Uh, but the voters have really the lion's share of the authority in this situation. So the goal is to help them make an informed decision when they go to the polls, which is always tricky. It doesn't matter what the subject is um, to get the masses of people that do go to the polls to be informed. Which sort of leads up to um, scheduling assuming that there's a question to be proposed in March. Yeah, and I can talk a little bit about that as well. So, so if we work backwards from that March date, um, so a ballot has to be warned not less than and not more than 40 days before town meeting day. So there's a 10 day window in which that has to be done. And so that's something, that's a window we have to work with every year anyway, in terms of warning a budget vote. So any vote to close a school or anything else would fall under that same regulation. And that puts the board having to make a decision on what's going to be on that ballot at their January meeting toward the end of January. That means the board's going to need to, as they've charged me with bringing them a recommendation, I believe the board needs to hear that recommendation at their December meeting because they're not going to want to hear a recommendation in January and act on that recommendation in that meeting when they're hearing it for the first time. They're going to want to hear it, discuss it, think about it, process it in between. Maybe there's some community engagement around that, and then come back to it in January for a second time, probably for more discussion leading up to a decision about what to put on the ballot. So if we think about that December timeline, and I would say December is probably the latest, and some might argue that the November meeting is when the board would like to hear a report. That makes me a little nervous just when I think about how much needs to happen in terms of community engagement and, and putting forth a really uh, sound and detailed recommendation. Uh, you know, that November, you know, mid to late November board meeting is really just around the corner. And I, I begin to wonder if there's enough time to, to engage in the process that I think we need to engage in 
with a recommendation coming out in November, which is why I'm thinking December realistically is probably when it, when it would come. But that's sort of where, where my mind is in terms of timeline. And I can chime in and add any more details if, as folks need them. Anybody got any questions at this point on either one of the, those two topics? Do we feel like between the NASDAQ report and the cost estimating that we, or the numbers that we've run in the background since then, that we can make global decisions and maybe that's kind of what you're looking at with this Excel file with the targeted options? That's the, those are the options that become, that make the numbers work and the brick and mortar work. And there's, there's a 20,000 foot you know, guidance that we can put on this conversation. I'm getting the sense that's where the conversation is going. I think, yeah, jumping ahead a little bit, um, I roughed out a matrix to kind of use as a tool to start looking at stuff maybe from a little bit of a logical point of view. And when we get get to that item, I think the first matter of discussion is, is does it reflect what we want to to be looking at? Um, it sort of includes some of the um, values, community values that were developed over the engagement process last fall, plus a few of the act, uh, questions, I guess you could call them, from the charge. And then there was a few things I just threw in there um, from, from my point of view as well. But I think um, Josh, and I don't know, hopefully that makes sense to you, but I think probably there, we need to start thinking about the schedule and start understanding how, how we're going to rationalize things. The other thing that we need to keep mindful of is there is a concurrent activity going on with the community engagement group to pulse the community and we, we need to be in sync with that and then so that we're not running ahead of them, if you will. Um, so I'm not, so, so if that, does that make sense? It does, it does. I, I, I just think back to the initial reason that we reached out to NESDEC and that we were gonna reach out to them and they were going to give some global direction to this process and we could say, oh yeah, it makes sense to go this direction or that direction not necessarily engage someone who's much more technically inclined to look at the, you know, every bolt and, you know, of, of a facility. So I guess the question that I'm asking is, do we feel like that we have that guidance at this, at this time to, or do we need to start looking at a much more nuanced uh, approach to specific sites and, and um, facilities and maybe we're not there. Maybe there's more of, um, maybe we're still, bubble diagramming this up in terms of how, how students move around or don't move around. Well, I can offer some, some thinking I've been doing to see if this, and I think this kind of keeps it to the 20,000 foot view that you brought forward, Josh. And I feel like we need to, we're at somewhere around 100,000 feet right now. I think we need to bring it down to 20,000 feet and then we can start bringing it down closer to ground level at some point. So, Part of where my 20,000 foot idea is, you know, I think there are some people that are very interested in, in keeping the bricks and mortar and want to understand the, the economic and programmatic impact of that, right? So if, if keeping bricks and mortar is the constant, what if finances were the other constant and programming was the variable, what's that look like? Or, if bricks and mortar is a constant and programming is a constant, what then happens to the taxes as a variable? So I feel like if we have that as one sort of bucket of an option, mm -hmm. a school closure bucket, and we can talk about, because we have a lot of options on what school closure could be, but if we have that bucket as well, and then we have a bucket that might include school closure, but also is a, uh, a relationship with Addison Northwest and what that could look like. So if we had, if we could narrow it down to three options like that, I think that covers a range of thoughts and interests and desires. Um, and then would give me something to work with 
as I think about a recommendation that I have to make to the board. So that, that's something that has started to make sense to me as a way to advance our work and, and our thinking. And mm -hmm. I offer that for whatever it's worth, if that resonates or doesn't. I, I think that's really smart. I mean, the way I've been looking at it is, is we have a spectrum of options right now. And it really starts to talk about the three pillars that um, Kevin was talking about. So having those three buckets uh, or three or four buckets, I mean, I see what was in the Excel spreadsheet being maybe one, one and a half bucket. Um, but it really gives you the tools to talk about it um, to, your, to your group as well. <clears throat> Sorry, did I take us up on a tangent? No, I don't think so. I think it's all in the spirit of trying to narrow the narrow the scope a little bit. Yeah. Which is critical and really hard. Yep. Yep. So any further discussion about the pressures and the schedule? <laughs> so Kevin, what do you need next to, to refine the, the description of those buckets in a meaningful so, way? Okay, I guess um, is where, where I'm thinking. Yeah, um, I don't know if at this point we, we I did have a, uh, a line here for budget and I don't know, I think, you know, just in general, it's, there's pressure there, a lot of pressure there. And I don't know if we need to know more than that at this point and then we can just jump into the charge questions and then right to the matrix yeah. that's where the interest is i can stay at a high level but give some context because obviously the reason we're having these conversations is driven by finances right like if if we were not in any financial troubles and we could keep running the way we are we probably would whether that's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do is a different conversation but i bet we'd still be doing what we've always done because it's comfortable and easy um the, the reality is, as, as we've been projecting, and obviously right now it's projections on top of projections in terms of what the spending threshold, which is set by the state will be, what our equalized pupil will be, although we have a formula that has worked well for us in the past and we've applied the NESDEC enrollment figures to that formula. Um, so based on all of our projections right now, we're, we're fairly confident that we can expect to have to cut somewhere in the ballpark of $1.2 million from our spending each year for at least the next decade. And so over the course of those 10 years, that's about $12 million that we need to find in savings. Um, and it, it would be, as I described, about $1.2 million each year. So we find ourselves perpetually in this, what, what do we try to save? What needs to get cut? And, and we, gradually work towards something that I think we would all agree is pretty uh, untenable. Like to the effect of, so 10 years out, needing to cut somewhere around 70, no, 93 positions. And when you think about cutting 93 positions over the next decade and what that does to programming, it, it starts to, you know, look, look like something we wouldn't want for our students, whether that's inability to offer a breadth of programming that we have or class sizes that are way larger than what we're comfortable with. Um, you know, cutting 93 positions out of an organization that has just over 300, it, we're gonna feel that. Um, so the reason we're having these conversations about our facilities is to try and, and think differently about how we meet these financial pressures that are very real, um, but do it in a way that impacts what we provide to our students far less and perhaps even seek opportunities to expand on what we do. So the money's real. It's 1.2 million per year um, is our projection at this point. So um, one quick question. So this is just um, to reiterate, to, to um, expand the conversation about status quo. How many school districts in Vermont do you get a sense are not meeting the um, student um, quota and paying the penalty or is it a you know a small minority or i'm not aware know? of any right now it's not okay. that they aren't out there but i couldn't tell you one right now that is 
paying a tax penalty because they're spending over the threshold. And if they are, they're effectively at the spending threshold a little bit over. Hmm. Well, you had your hand up. Did, did Virgins go over the year? Uh, I didn't think so. I thought they made changes to get under, but if they didn't, they, they were dollars over because yeah. they didn't quite hit it. They're, they're effectively so both as I understand it. Going down the route of keeping all schools is both financially untenable and unprecedented. Fairly unprecedented, yes. We would definitely be in the minority if, if we were asking taxpayers to spend over the spending threshold, I think. Maybe that practice changes over the coming years with the pressures building. But as of right now, yeah, I would say there are very few communities that are doing that. And we, and we have a range, right? Some communities have education spending, you know, 13,000, 14,000, 15,000 per student. And we're at, you know, 19 pushing 20,000 a student. So um, many communities don't have to have this conversation because their spending is considerably lower per student. So it's a it's a non-issue for them. Thanks for that, Patrick. That makes it very clear. Okay, so we move on to the next topic then. So the next uh, next topic has to do with the charge essential questions, and I did make up a document, and as part of part of the. Um, agenda where I separated out um, some of the activities clearly are something that the administration needs and can do. Some of it, I think that um, we had started looking at, or I had, at least I had started looking at, um, or things that in, in a sense the community engagement committee is actually doing. There was some steps about how you can go to a revenue-based model essentially by increasing dollars in, which the community committee engagement committee, I believe, um, has made some efforts to address that. And then one of them is about which towns are exploring closing or would explore closing their elementary school. And the community engagement committee again is polling, we'll be polling for that question. So really, unless somebody sees a different layout of the questions, there's really three questions on that, of the charge questions that seem like there's sort of things that we should be mindful of. So I would entertain some comments on that or considerations. I like radio silence here. So if that's not a burning issue and people are kind of lined up with that's the lay of the land, particularly Patrick, your group, um, the next the next thing to talk about, I guess, would be the the matrix and uh, consider a draft and um, see where where the values are that we want to kind of align ourselves with as we try to understand this, understand the importance of the different options. I did take the liberty, um, like I said, as far as the topics are concerned, anything color-coded blue are from the assessment tool that was a product of the community engagement last fall. The red stuff was the three questions that I had kind of um, pigeonholed for our group on the charge questions that we just briefly discussed and anything in black was um, I took the liberty to add that knowing primarily they all have to do with dollars that a lot of the discussions to date haven't really looked at dollars which is was just, as they say the almighty dollar you know and then I also, on the left-hand column for the different options, I took the liberty of taking some of the NESDEC options that I felt were similar to the charge options and nested those. So I think that that 
those assumptions need a little discussion. And then if there are any other aspects that we should be considering, we should talk about those as well. Kevin, I didn't want to interrupt your explanation of, of the matrix, but I do think it's probably valuable to take some time to talk about the three questions under the, the facilities feasibility committee to discuss. Okay. That sets That's a what context. I actually was going to bring up. Oh, great. Okay, let's back up then. Because I, I think, yeah, I think our, our conversation around these will help drive the conversation around what options make sense for us. So, so that first question, what are the advantages to kids and what are the advantages to a town of keeping all elementary schools in the towns where the kids reside? And I'm assuming the, the flip side to that is what would be the disadvantages of doing so? Because I think there are advantages and disadvantages. Well, you also could look at it like what are the advantages of them going somewhere else instead of it being a negative? Like, Mm -hmm. So we have to come up with these three answers. <laughs> okay. Well, I think they're, so they're here. I guess I'm curious if they're really here as questions that need to be answered or as considerations making a recommendation, right? So I feel like some of the questions have an answer and others are a little trickier to answer. Um, but I think they're all important to consider and to discuss. So I, I, I find the format of the question to be weighted towards the, that the, each town is a singular entity and that the five town area is not a community unto itself. Um, which, which I find to be curious. Uh, so, I think there's a lot of advantages and a lot of sync, um, similarities between adjacent towns and villages. I mean, you could always argue that each town should have its own little league baseball team, but um, I don't know how everyone feels about that. So I will, I will mention, Josh, that these questions, I believe, Patrick, you can confirm it, but I believe these questions were, are as written at the last community engagement. So whoever formulated the question as it was written down is how we see it today even. Yeah, and that's, so that was back in January. We had a retreat, I think on a Saturday with the school board, the entire administrative team and a few members of the community engagement committee. And as we were effectively then working to whittle down from from many, many options to a handful of options to help um, get a, a consultant to dig a little deeper for us on. These questions, these 18 questions in their entirety surfaced as sort of essential questions that were important either for answers uh, or, or for consideration as we were moving the process forward and, and landing on some recommendation hmm. to act on. And, and I, I may be out of term to say it, but the person that posed the question could very well have been biased on how they posed the question. Yeah, I mean, I read the question. I, I agree with having a local facility and its advantages generally outstrip those of having a general facility. You could always play the game of the negatives and the positives of having a larger pool to draw from versus a smaller local down the street, you know, backwater school. Um, I guess backwater has negative connotations, but it, I think you, to me, it balances out a lot in many ways. Um, that's where I, I get tripped up a little bit in looking at the different scenarios. That's, yeah. that's what I mean. That's, that's where I go. And I, so I've, I've read this question several times and I think where I get tripped up is I don't disagree. There are advantages to kids. And really we're talking about kindergarten through sixth grade currently because our older kids go to a school in a different town already. But I do think there are advantages to kids going to a, a school that's closer to home uh, that is 
part of their town. I won't say community because I think about community in a broader term than, than a town, but that is part of their town and there's a, a sense of town and a sense of, um, I don't know, like that hometown feel, like all those are good things and, and, and what that school brings to that town, I think is of value. I don't disagree with any of that. Where I get tripped up is when I, so I obviously understand our situation at a really deep level. I, I feel as though I have to weigh those advantages with or against either taxes that are way, way higher than they are now, which I think is, is problematic for many, or an experience in those buildings that doesn't look anything like the experience we're providing now. Like, so I'm picturing, is it worth keeping all of our schools open to have class sizes of 35 and not offering art or music? If we take it to an extreme, right? If we're talking about programming being far less than the advantages of a school in my town, that, that could be. If, I, if, I, if we have to cut 95 positions over the next decade, is that a reality for us? I don't know. Um, and I certainly wouldn't say that the advantage of the advantages brought forward by having those buildings in our towns is the same if those are the conditions inside that building. So that's where I get tripped up when I when I start weighing those. I agree. I agree. I, I honestly think the sense of the of the township is we have a very small colloquial experience here in Vermont and it's it's the way it's been for a long time. If you go outside of Vermont, the townships are much broader. Um, getting across the town is, is can be a bigger deal. And I don't think it's a, a big step to see, for instance, a Moncton New Haven community. Um, or Starksboro Lincoln community. I don't think that's a step too far, potentially, because it, it, we're always making the argument of what, well, we're losing our community school. Well, a com combined school serving the two townships, I don't think is a step too far, personally. I mean, obviously, there's going to be those who disagree with me. I think coupled with this, and th these three questions could be considered interrelated, but coupled with this is the uh, financial viability of the town if it didn't have a school in it. Yeah, I would definitely say that fits into the research about the impact of closing a school on a community or town. Yeah, and again, in, in talking with my superintendent colleague who's really been living this and, and, and was very active in, in his dissertation on this, um, it depends on the town and you have to really weigh those other things. Like what else, if the school's not there, what else would keep the town together? Um, and different towns have, have different, even, even if you think about within our five towns, there's a range in what you know, and some towns have a really vibrant general store that is a center of the community. Others mm -hmm. have a general store. Some have a really active recreation program, others less so. Some have town halls that are busy with events and others don't. Um, so I think those are important factors. Um, and, and it has to be assessed on a town by town basis. It's not the impact wouldn't be the same. I also think it's important to assess to what extent is the school currently a center point for that town's sort of the, the fabric of that town? I think that's different town by town, school by school. Um, and, and my general sense in, in conversations with people, and again, this is just sort of what my perception of what I'm hearing from talking with folks and, and you all talk with folks as well. So weigh in on this. Our elementary schools are most, and, and dramatically so, most impacted or, or most attended or visited by parents of elementary school kids. 
if you're not a parent of a student in that building, you're far, far less connected to that building. So it's a matter of what, what percentage of our towns are parents of children in that school or perhaps grandparents that might come on a, you know, an open house or uh, this year. What's that? Not this year. <laughs> Not this year. <laughs> the odds of me even seeing my own kid's classroom are pretty low. That's the way it goes. So, you know, Did you watch my video? Yes, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> you at least got a glimpse in the building. Yeah. So, so grand grandparents follow their kids to some degree as well, but uh, you're, you're absolutely right about that community. Is Jeff still on the phone? Or is, can he talk at all? Yeah, he has, he has speaking capabilities right now. He's, his talking is allowed. Um, I don't know if he's out of service or if he's lost connection or I'm not sure. He'd be driving, so he may. He may not be. Yeah, I might oh, be just listening. Said he's not in the meeting. I just texted him on the meeting board in it. <clears throat> said he's not in the meeting. I, I always go back um, to the same concept of what is the purpose of the school system and education. And I, I really struggle with the number one need being uh, to help the community maintain its community -ness. And I think that there's a lot of work that the towns and the community or however you want to um, define it should be doing that should not be on the educational structure. And I, I have felt that way for a long time. So whether I love my town school or not, I just am not sure that's always been our purpose and we should keep that in mind as well. Anybody else have thoughts? Do we want to go through each question individually? We sort of started talking about the first bullet. And I think we talked some about the second as well, the impact of closing school in a community or town. Yeah. So I, my comment, my comment on that um, is obviously at one point I was surfing for, for uh, reports or whatever. And of course, like anything, you can find find what you want to present if you look hard enough. But going going through all the different aspects, a lot of it was city inner, you know, it's not inner city, but city city closures of school is much more common than rural. But some of the rural reports that I could see or studies that I could see is is it really dependent on the viability of your community? um if the school was there or not you know and i i struggle with any one of the five towns um that isn't vibrant enough that if the school was gone that the the town fabric would implode um that's just the way i look at at the value of the school in the community. Is it a plus? Sure it is. But if the school is closed, is, is the, the town be going to become a ghost town? Um, unlikely. Hmm. So the last question, the last of the three, if we um, would be the advantages of keeping the middle to high school in the five town area, which I assume this is sort of a consideration if we were to consolidate with Addison Northwest or even with Addison Northwest, Addison Central and Mount Abe would end up looking very different than it does today.
Yeah, so I think the some of the NASDAQ options still had the Mount Aid facility being used, but it looked like either a 6-8 middle school or a 9-12 high school for the Addison Northwest and Mount Abe communities was the sort of dominant idea coming through that. Patrick, is there, do you have a sense that we could, we could put both Addison Northwest and, and um, Mount Abe into one facility or would it, with, without renovation or would it would require both facilities at some level? It might be in years down the road. I think the the seven twelve population at um, and especially if we're talking six twelve because a lot of what we were a lot of the configurations had that in there. So if it's six twelve, uh, even at seven twelve, Mount Abe combined with Virgins right now, I think would probably put us in the eleven hundred ish range of students, which I think is pretty well busting at the seams at Mount Abe. So I think it's a little, it's a little big. It's not way over. It's probably comfortably 200. You know, if, if Mount Abe is around 900, I think that's a pretty good fit for its current structure. So 1100 is a, a bit over full. Is Virgen's a larger facility? No, it's a, I think it's a smaller facility square footage wise. I don't, I don't know that for sure. I don't know their square footage, but just having spent time in both facilities, uh, I think Mount Eve has more square footage and, and a good portion of the square footage that Virgins has. Like, so they have a, a giant gym that they just um, recently added. So that's a, that's a lot of square footage um, for that facility. So yeah, I think we can, we can very clearly Mount Abe can house all of the students in Addison Northwest right now. They're, they're somewhere around 850, I think, in Addison Northwest total. So it's, it's a big enough facility. Um, I think it's a bigger facility than what, what Virgin's high school is. Needs more work, I think, than Virgin's, but it has more square footage. Yeah, I think, and so I guess I think about that in two different ways. So some of the early conversations, like when I'm thinking about coming out of January was we don't operate a high school at all, that we allow kids to choice out. And I think that's different, that has a different impact than some sort of a merger with Virgins that still utilizes Mount Abe as a middle or high school in terms of the impact on our community's identity. You know, the, the idea that you don't have a local high school sports team, for example, and what that does to um, the identity our community has or a high school uh, drama performance or, you know, the whole variety of things, the, the arts festival that we do every year. Um, I feel like those sorts of things at your local high school do have a, a really significant impact on your community's identity. So if we did merge with Virgins and we had that kind of relationship and we were sharing middle schoolers and high schoolers, it would be, it would reshape our identity, but we would maintain an identity, I guess is where my mind goes, which I think is different than not operating a high school and kids go to any school of their choice in the area, then I feel like we, we don't have an identity anymore. And we have an awful lot of ego gear to do something with. I agree with that, Patrick. I don't have much to add to that. I think that um, high school, middle school, at least one I'm not a big fan of shipping high schoolers off. I agree. I think that's a 
it's it is actually I agree identity killing. I agreed with every way that you just put that. So, Josh, I'm not clear when you say you're not in in favor of shipping high school students off. Does that mean to a choice situation or to another school? Yeah, I, I, it's a little bit of tongue in cheek statement, but um, you know, uh, keeping keeping the students here in the community next step and as young families, we start taking that fabric apart, or we could be being much more popular. You were breaking up. Could you? I didn't catch it all. I said, uh, and my I think this is my speaker. The um, Taking kids out of the community and shipping them off to other schools is the first step to losing young families. So it becomes a cyclical issue potentially to losing students over the generations. My audio poor again? No, well. So you, in, in either one of the situations, I guess I'm still, I'm, <laughs> I may be trying to lead you to somewhere, but I'm still yeah. not clear um, if that is a concern with both options or if that is a concern with one or the other. Would one or the other be in high school choice where everybody gets a voucher and goes wherever, as opposed to co-locating with, for example, Addison Northwest? I don't see the same issue with co-locating with Addison Northwest, no. I see Virgens and, and Bristol's being very close, two close communities. Having grown up in the area, I remember interacting with people with Virgins as a high schooler. Um, I think the it's a very good uh, synchron, uh, synchronizing and it'd be very easy, personally. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that particular bullet? No, I think the only other part to the Virgins thing is um you know we've merged a lot of things with them and i think we should continue to explore um even pro even as starter points programming etc et to really take advantage of um where we both don't have things to maybe be able to create things or maintain things yeah kind of a go do thing then yeah, I, I don't disagree at all. And it's interesting, you know, as you think about the range of, of relationships that we could have with Addison Northwest. So one thing we could do is continue to look for um, ways that we can collaborate. So we have a couple of sports teams now, we have our food service program, we can start talking about, you know, do we try to combine AP courses so that we can continue to offer a range of, of those kinds of programs. We can continue to go down that path and reap some of those benefits. And we then, interestingly enough, in some ways we begin operating as single districts, as a single district, I should say, without necessarily some of the added fiscal benefits of actually being a single district. So, uh, you know, to do all the work and only reap half of the reward, at some point you have to question if that makes sense. And nevertheless, in the, in the meantime, if we if that isn't a decision that the community makes, I think we still have to keep looking for that, right? So if we if we effectively, and obviously this is an extreme, but if we get to the point where we're offering half the programming and Virgenz is offering half the programming because that's what our numbers have whittled down to, and that's the program, that's the way we can can sustain programming. But we still have two central offices filled with people running two separate organizations. I think we have to ask the question why because there's hundreds of thousands maybe millions of dollars in savings more to reap and get those same benefits that we sort of worked around that decision to get so it's 6 22 and we're not keeping the schedule here um if we're are we ready to are we are we finished with this one? Are we ready to move on to the matrix discussion? Yes. Yes. 
Yes. So, um, oh, I had started to kind of lay it out. So I guess unless everybody's got that fresh in their mind, it's time to open it up for discussion or for discussion. Uh, um, go ahead. Kevin, oh, sorry. Can I just no, clarify? Ahead. Are we on part seven or part eight? We're on part seven. Okay. Discussion honing in on the optimal solution. Yep. And which then, is so, also the matrix. It is. So the doc reference in, in eight, well, this is the option matrix should be in seven. Okay. That's what part, you were clarifying at the beginning. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, good Josh. Uh, just to kick off, I, I think that both the, at least at this 20,000 foot level, that both option two uh, A and two B are, are in my mind a single option um, and, and counter balance, counter considering the uh, three options under um, option seven, where we start to talk about uh, district sharing and um, there's a couple other um, nuances in those following options. Um, again, I, I see this question that we're chewing on as a spectrum of possibilities. And I think earlier in the conversation, we eliminated the far left or right, wherever you want to be, uh, which is the status quo. Um, so uh, as we start to hone in on sir, um, I guess the question to the group is this, is this the meeting center that we want to live in, um, the, the two and, and the seven with some iterations. I, I, I get the sense that the response will be yes. Unless there's something we're, we're leaving off the table. I'm not sure I followed the question, Josh. Is there, an, is there other options that we haven't considered that should be added into this as the center of the spectrum that we're looking at? Um, I guess I'd have to revisit the, the NASDAQ report. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think the, I think the options that surfaced from the fall are clearly here. Some of which were the NESDEC, you know, NESDEC had some options that mirrored those really closely and NESDEC had some things that were a little different. And I think those are included here. So I do, nothing's jumping out at me as an option missing from the list of options here. And I'm assuming that was your approach, Kevin, was to sort of pull from what the four that surfaced from the fall and winter and then anything that looked a little different from NESDEC. Yeah. So a point of clarification if it says charge scenario it was from the, the charge and then the nasdaq options are um, obviously from the nasdaq report but i think josh you raised an interesting question about and 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 it and looking at the summaries here we've lost something between 2a and 2b i think I guess we Kevin, can you talk a little more about what the something is that you're seeing that we might have lost? So Josh made the comment that 2A and 2B were close enough together that maybe they should be considered together. And then at the last community engagement, we bantered back and forth with those two and kept them separate. And I can't, off the top of my head without going back and looking. Oh, somewhere. I see. There's a middle school and a high school and the, they're separate facilities. Yeah, so one is three facilities and one is four facilities. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Yeah, that's okay. That was, that was a nuance in there that if you hadn't been part of the conversation, it would be easy to miss. And, and one other thing, I think, 
you know, looking at the NESDAQ report in looking at scenario 2B, that is two elementary schools, a middle and a high school separate without any kind of sort of merger with Virgins or Addison Northwest. Um, the only place that could probably hold the middle school that isn't Mount Abe would be Bristol Elementary School. And then looking at the numbers, I'm, I'm less convinced that all of our K-5 kids could fit into two elementary schools when one of them is not Bristol. Just from a square footage perspective, I think we're, we're kind of busting at the seams again, like, like in the Mount Abe scenario earlier that we talked about. So, yeah, just in light of that, I wonder, and, and I think eventually 2B could become an option as our numbers decline. But I think in, in the early stages of any change that might happen, that may be, it may not be quite enough schools. So from a feasibility standpoint, I wonder about 2B now. I always thought 2B was weird. Well, and I also think, you know, <laughs> Right. And so eventually when we're going to have, I don't know, 300 students in 912 or something like that, 350 in a building that can house a thousand, it raises the question of, so what happens with the additional square footage? And is that initially the talk was maybe that's an opportunity for the public private partnership, um, which we acknowledge has many benefits, probably the least of which is financial because the, the going rate for the cost per square foot was gonna be a drop in the bucket compared to our relative financial uh, concern. Um, so again, other benefits, but it doesn't necessarily solve the financial concern, which is the most pressing at this point. That's what's really driving the conversations is the need to, to adjust financially. It doesn't, it's kind of hypocritical. I, I've always been like, well, I don't understand why we would take kids out of the high school. Um, that's not going to sell it. That's actually going to go the other way. I don't know. Yeah. And part of where my mind is going, too, is I think about, so again, when I come back to the three buckets, one is keep all our schools open. What does that mean for taxes or what does that mean for program? The other is a school closure bucket and what does that look like? And the third is a merger bucket and what does that look like? If, if we're talking about the school closure bucket, I don't know about you, but I don't find the topic of school closure enjoyable. And I don't desire having this conversation more than once in my career. So if we're gonna talk about school closure, my preference would be let's do school closure to the extent we need to and really make a big decision once rather than pretty big decisions multiple years over. I think that what that would do to a community to be perpetually talking about school closure is more damaging than the act of um, having to close schools. So if we're gonna if we're gonna talk school closure, I'd I'd like to to take it to the extent that we can, that will be sustainable for a long time, as opposed to something that feels more palatable in the last two or three years, and then we're back two or three years later talking about more school closure, and then two or three years after that talking about another school closure. That to me would be really, really, really difficult on communities. I think that everything we do needs to have a lens of creation and not destruction and having a bu building something instead of cons like always chopping the head off of the next person isn't seem all that kind. So I, I would love to find, I don't think we're going to be able to market it unless we can really have a positive gain and i think we kind of have to have a handle on having pros outweigh the cons and so i like the matrix because i think it out starts to put a little bit of i don't know numerical 
qualitative, quantitative thoughts to it. Yeah, the term that I've heard a lot, um, you know, is that in business is right sizing the ship. So um, that's the creative process I think you're talking about. Um, yeah. Well, and some of the creativity comes along with, so when you write size, you're finding efficiency and that efficiency can create new opportunity, right? So I, part of what I'm reading into what you're saying, Sarah, is our goal should be more. And for me, this has always been true. When we had to cut a couple million dollars a few years back and do some major changes, the goal was not save what we can. The goal was find ways to get better despite the fact that we have to make these hard decisions. So I feel the same way as we're looking at, you know, reconfiguring our school system. We, it's not just about save what we can. It's about re-envision how we operate and thinking about how could, what could we be doing even better? What kind of programming do we wish we were offering now that maybe we can find a way as we navigate these, these challenging times? That's absolutely the perspective I'm taking. And, and again, as I'm starting to dig into some of the financial sides of things, I think it's entirely feasible to expand programming if we create some of these efficiencies that we're talking about. So to that point, are we seeing the, the, um, the math in this matrix is seeing the um, status quo is zero all across the board. And then we start talking about, talking about pluses and negatives as we envision alternates. Is that how you were seeing the, the, the math working on this, Kevin? I, I think you. Uh, not to lead you, but there could be pluses and minuses on status quo as well as neutral. I think you could have, and I didn't go to a number system because I, to me at this level, I mean, that's a refinement step at this level. It's just like, what's, what's good and what's bad. And, you know, if, if people are agreeable to that, that's kind of the thought process, but I don't think that just one of the options, the other would just drive one one aspect to the other, I guess. Kevin, I'm curious if we each um, filled this out, how similar our answers would be. Well, I think I think we I think we're going to have homework. Person, you know, I think we're going to have some homework here, and, and I think if we get through, um, I, I just to time check, I have a hard stop at seven, so <laughs> I don't know anybody else does or not, but. Um, so if we do a process check and, you know, if, if there's topics that we need to add for consideration, that would be great to understand those. And, and I heard a little bit of kicking around of the options, but I don't hear necessarily a reduction in options at this point and let the, let the pluses and minuses start driving that. Well, I heard that um, 7B is coming off the table. Which one's 7B? Is that right? Was it 2B? Is it 2B? The one where you talked about additional closures over multiple years? Maybe I misheard. Oh, no, I thought you were talking about the two elementary schools and a separate middle and high school. Okay. No. I, I think it's fair to go through and I don't think it will take long to do the plus minus neutral for each of these across the board. Um, I'm trying to remember if we have, and this may be an attachment or something we can send out. So for the community values, I think there may have been a descriptor for each of those. Yes, there is. Um, I I'm not sure where to go right off the top of my head again, but I think in the Bay I can help. facilities folder, it's in there. I can help find that and get that distributed too, Kevin. I can find it, um, not under stress though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just think in particular, you know, thinking about 
Josh and Jeff who weren't part of those conversations, it'll be good to have that little descriptor that you're yep. thinking about because that academic excellence may mean a lot of different things. It'd be good to know what the community thought as it came up with that term. Um, was like, were the blue ones, those are all those community values from the meetings with the yes. community? Okay. Yep. Yes, I'd, I'd like that too. Yeah. yeah. So it, yeah, I, I'll put, I can get it um, and send it back out with this, with this matrix. One, one thing um, I kind of battered around a little bit and I think we, there's been discussions about it too, is community connections. I, I end up putting it underneath programming, thinking that it's important for, important for the school to reach out to make those connections, more important than to have those connections in the community, but it could be argued either way, I suppose, or maybe we should put it in each block, I don't know. So where do we want to go from here? So I think the homework assignment makes perfect sense in, in filling this out. And maybe I can just sort of air with this group something I'm wrestling with and you can help me think it through. So there's a piece of me that feels like this group would benefit from once we whittle down the options to a few to hear from me about some of the programmatic or financial pros and cons to those options with some details. And there's a piece of me that feels like that's pretty close to making a recommendation and that could be premature because my, my charge is to make the recommendation to the board. And so I put that out there just to share something I'm wrestling with and would love to hear your thoughts on it, knowing that my disposition would be to stop short of effectively making my recommendation before this committee because my charge is to make it to the board. Patrick, when are you making the recommendation to the board? Unless someone suggests something otherwise, it, it wasn't made clear in my charge from the board when to make the recommendation, just that I make the recommendation. My, my thinking is December is when I'm gonna be making that recommendation. I think we need time to hear more from the community and um, more time to do the financial analysis Etc. So, are that's you wor worried about the sequence? Is that what I'm gathering? Okay. Yeah. So, thinking about like wanting to really engage collaboratively with this group, but knowing that there comes a point at which push is obvious. I'm yeah. It becomes yeah, and it becomes. Yeah, it becomes obvious and I've effectively made a recommendation to this committee instead of the board and, and the, the challenges that may, they may come about from that. Um, so it's just something I'm struggling to navigate myself and, and I would, my disposition is, is toward transparency, but as things are building, um, I need to be mindful that my charge is to make a recommendation to the board. So I feel like this committee's purpose is to help you make a decision to make to the board and that that doesn't always mean you have to get our blessing in some ways that that we're here to talk you through where you're you know the pros and cons of different things and to give some different perspectives to help you make a decision and so I think you need to use your own sequence um and i hope that we can help you make a good decision thank you
I took from that what I needed, and I hope it was what you intended. <laughs> I don't want to speak for the rest of these people. <laughs> yeah. That was just where I wanted to give you my. Josh, you have any comments to that? I agree completely. Um, you know, I think that we've kind of been walking down this hallway, and I think things have been coming into focus, especially with documents like this. And I, you know, Patrick, from his perspective, knows where the conversation is heading. So, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, if it becomes It waters. Um, so I think, and I've, tr I've tried to play a role of bringing up some of tangential concerns that may impact the conversation. Um, so knowing that, that there is this trajectory. And I find those tangential concerns really helpful. I think it helps to make sure that we're looking at the, the situation from a lot of different angles. And so I personally appreciate that, so I'd, I'd hope you continue to to go down that road. I think it's important, and it's an important depth that we have those conversations. So, how far do we go? We probably do this matrix option exercise, and then past that, we're probably um, close to the end of our charge once we discuss the pros and cons of the uh, the matrix. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of where my mind is going, right? So if, if, you know, in October, we have some clarity from this group about thoughts on the scenarios and the community values and, and you know, everything in the matrix here. And there may be some other topics that we want to talk through a little bit more. Maybe we want to dig into some of the other answers. I don't know, but um, that from a timeline perspective, I feel like I'd be ready to start putting together all of the information that I need to gather to to collect my own thoughts. Simultaneously, the community engagement committee will be really active in the month of October. Um, so we'll have a lot more thinking from the community and reactions from the community that will be really helpful. Um, and that sort of convergence of this team's work and the community engagement's work, I think will give me the, the rest of the information I need to to make my recommendation to the board for their December meeting. Because that'll basically give me the month of November and, in, and a little bit into December to build out that recommendation. And I think it will take all of that to do it well. So I believe where we're going with this is I will email out to the board or the subcommittee the um, background information, the matrix, and whatever background information with the the core values and whatnot, and then we will chew on that as individuals come back together in October and kind of discuss our points of view um, of how we evaluated the matrix. Then does that sound right to everybody? Sounds good to me. Okay. So in the interest of time, um, we will, I'm, I'm not, unless anybody has any burning desire to go around the table, there's not that many of us here today anyway, or not that many will forego that unless anybody has a burning issue with that. Okay, and then do we have anybody out there for public comment or we want to give public comment we do have two folks i don't know her mentioned before that he was challenged by technology so i don't know about making a comment or in the chat or raising his hand i can give her permission to speak and just we can check in and see yes can do that. If, that would, if everybody's in agreement with that all right herb i think you should have permission to speak now you don't have to, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity in case you had something to say. Uh, do you hear me? Yep. 
Son of a gun, I see. You control the mute button. There we go. Now I understand how this works. <laughs> um, you know, I, no, I don't have any further comments. Um, you guys have, uh, are obviously working hard. Um, I think it's important, however, uh, to get this information out to people as uh, both the detailed financial and programmatic information, Patrick, out to uh, people um, as they're sorting through these decisions. Um, you know, so that means probably sooner than your, your timeline, I think, calls for having the detailed information coming out. Uh, sounds like December. And uh, I would encourage you to try to jumpstart that because I think it's difficult for people to grapple with these issues and give you any sort of useful feedback unless they, you know, it's a chicken the egg kind of thing. You know, if they don't have the information, how are they going to make the decision? So I would urge you to try to uh, do that sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. So any other public comment? There's a phone caller on here. I'm not sure who it is. I can give them a chance to speak if you want to just check in. Because again, I'm not sure their ability to make a comment in the, in the chat or raise their hand. Right. Phone caller ending in 8580. If you have public comment, now would be the time. Okay. So um, I guess the next thing to do is entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye, aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? There, I think we've got it. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank, thank, thank you all.